Day with everyone and welcome back to another episode in our series on the history of Ireland. In today's video, we'll be looking at Ireland during the late modern period, specifically Ireland from 1750 until independence in the 20th century. The era would see the expansion of Irish desires for independence, distrust in English leadership, and a revival of Gaelic culture. So get on your best dancing shoes and grab a pint of Guinness as we go back in time to learn all about Ireland during the late modern era. By the 18th century, Ireland's parliament began to see English control of the island as an obstacle in Ireland's future. Irishman Henry Grattan and his supporters argued for more favorable trade negotiations with England, and England, at least partially, listened. The British granted free trade between the islands and amended Poynings Law, which allowed the English to legislate for Ireland. The English also allowed for the establishment of an independent Irish militia known as the Irish Volunteers, organized for National Guard duty and under the authority of the Irish government. Dublin expanded canals and roads in the city, and grain mills multiplied, making Ireland a major economic territory of the British Empire. Catholics were still banned from serving in Parliament, however, and further reforms stalled during the Napoleonic Wars out of fears the Irish would rebel and side with Napoleonic France. It would be a group of Protestants, however, that would attempt that feared rebellion. Known as the United Irishmen, a small band of Irish Protestants rebelled against England to replace the English crown's authority with an independent republic. The group allied with militant Irish Catholics known as Defenders. The rebellion lasted only three months, but led to 30,000 deaths and defeat for hopes of an independent republic. In response to fears of further uprisings, the British Crown instigated a system of shipping Irish dissidents as prisoners to Australia. And it wasn't just men. Young women and girls found guilty of minor crimes would also find themselves on ships bound for Australia for service as maids for wives under a system to pair single British settlers with young Irish women to keep both on their best behavior while overseas in Australia. The British also passed the Acts of Union in 1800 to establish the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland in an attempt to symbolically elevate Ireland as an equal to Great Britain under British law. Eventually, this led to the dissolution of the Irish Parliament and the introduction of Irish landowners to the British Parliament. Irish Catholic lawyer and politician Daniel O'Connell campaigned for reforms to allow Irish Catholics to once again own land and serve in politics, and found an ally in another ancestor of mine, Arthur Wellesley. Wellesley, better known as the Duke of Wellington, was an Anglo-Irish war hero who defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, and later became a British Prime Minister. With his political power, Wellesley campaigned for the rights of Irish Catholics, culminating in the Roman Catholic Relief Act of 1829, allowing Irish Catholics to serve in Parliament. While far from equal to the English, things were looking up for the Irish. That is, until a fungal infection hit Ireland's potato harvest following the Napoleonic Wars. The Great Irish Famine that ensued would cripple the country. The depopulation as a result of starvation and emigration that followed would shake Ireland to its core. It would not be until almost 200 years later that Ireland's population would return to the number it saw before the Great Famine. Nearly two million pounds at the time reached Ireland for recovery efforts, including money raised by the Choctaw Nation of the United States, former slaves in the Caribbean, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, and Queen Victoria in England. 
Rumors that the English had poisoned Ireland's crop fields and created the famine led to several underground organizations prepared to launch another rebellion against the British Empire, including one organization known as the Young Irelanders. In 1848, the Young Irelanders formed a confederation with other underground resistance groups to launch a rebellion against the British, starting with a planned assault on police headquarters. The assault failed, and the rebellion petered out with sporadic fighting over the next year, and its leaders were shipped off to Tasmania as punishment. While most farm workers in Ireland either died or left Ireland during the Great Famine, those who survived and remained campaigned for improved working conditions during an era known as the Land War. These largely Catholic farm workers claimed their land had been wrongfully stripped from them by British Protestants and demanded what they called the three Fs, free rent, free sale, and fixity of tenure. The most effective method of the protesters would be boycotting British goods, leading to the Irish Land Acts giving land rights to tenant farmers, improvements to rural housing, and giving Irish Catholics the right to buy and sell land. Although the Irish language had gone into decline well before the Great Famine, it was still the most commonly spoken language in Ireland in the 1840s. Due to increased English migration to Ireland, however, and the mass migrations of Irish settlers to England to the United States, the language fell out of common use by 1900. Irish nationalists spent this time building support for neo-Gaelic revival efforts through poetry, literature, and other art forms. Irish athletes founded the Gaelic Athletics Association to promote sports like hurling and Gaelic football, and Irish writers blended Gaelic and English to create a uniquely literary voice known as Hiberno-English, made famous by writers like Oscar Wilde. As politics in Ireland moved further towards moderate tendencies, Irish citizens became increasingly favorable towards reinstating an Irish parliament under British authority. Charles Stuart Parnell ran with this idea and campaigned for a moderate approach towards home rule that would see a semi-independent Ireland as a region of the British Empire, like how Greenland works under Danish rule today. Parnell's 1889 divorce, however, would make him a controversial figure, and British politicians, eager to quell any further reforms to Irish Catholics, used his divorce proceedings to end any discussions of home rule. By the beginning of the 20th century, Dublin had become a city of extreme wealth, but also extreme poverty. The city's tenements displayed some of the worst conditions of any city in the British Empire, and its largest red light district, known as Monto. Social activism was strong during the era, especially under activists James Larkin and James Connolly. Trade unions went on strike, including one in Belfast, in which even the police joined a 10,000-man labor strike. In the Dublin lockout of 1913, 20,000 workers lost their jobs, for simply joining a labor union, launching a riot that resulted in three deaths. Divisions formed with those in Northern Ireland siding with British labor unions and those in the rest of Ireland organizing under an Irish union umbrella. In 1916, militant laborers organized under Connolly joined members of the Irish Volunteers, and underground Irish organizations to launch the Easter Uprising, an armed insurrection that would spark a revolution. Born during the height of the First World War, the British were quick to end the rebellion before it could lead to defeat on battlefields in France, imprisoning those organizing the rebellion. After the Great War ended, however, the rebellion resumed. From 1919 to 1921, Irish guerrilla fighters launched brutal campaigns against the British, leading to a 1921 treaty granting Southern and Western Ireland independence from the British Empire. Early independence was not exactly strong for Ireland, however. 
Disagreements over whether Ireland would be fully independent from the UK, like the United States, or maintain political connections to their former imperial rulers, like with, say, Canada or Australia, led to a violent nationwide civil war in 1923 that caused more deaths than its war of independence. Eventually, Ireland decided to sever all political ties to the United Kingdom, and those who led efforts to maintain political ties found themselves executed for voicing their opposition. The road to Irish independence was long and shaky, and it wasn't always marked by warrior poets or philosopher politicians. There is a serious case to be made that Irish terrorists gained independence for Ireland, especially considering the violent executions of early moderate dissidents in its first decade of independence. In our final episode, we'll be discussing the contemporary Republic of Ireland, its current politics, its recent history, and the culture that defines Ireland today. Make sure you don't miss out by hitting the subscribe button below. This video was made possible by contributions to this channel's Patreon from viewers like you. Thank you.